Welcome back to Tradman, everybody. Um, this is your co-host Jason here. I'm kind of running it solo today without my co-host Mark. Um, but we've got a very good and exciting episode to bring you. Um, we've got Sister Mary Yosef on um, to talk about uh, religious life, particularly for the ladies out there and uh, what it means to to be religious, uh, to live in a religious life and how they serve God and uh, maybe uh, help the young ladies out there that are discerning, uh, you know, their vocation in life, um, help them figure out how to properly discern which direction to go uh, with their life. Um, uh, Sister Mary Yosef, um, would you mind leading us in a prayer before we begin? Certainly. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or pro nobis peccatorum. Nunc ad in hora mortis nostre, Amen. I am all thine, and all that I have is thine, most loving Jesus, through Mary, thy most holy mother. Bless me, dear Mother, Thou and Thy Divine Son. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for coming on. Um, just for any listeners out there, we have a, a slight delay. Uh, not, not very bad, but... Um, but but just a forewarning on that. But I guess we'll just start, uh, Sister Mary, if you would like to tell us about your um, your your religious group that you're a part of and, and your life, and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Oh, I'm a member of the Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles. We are a new shoot from old roots, so to speak, because we follow the rule of St. Benedict, it was written, of course, in the 500s, and there have been many families of Benedictines since then. Our community started very recently, though, only 25 years ago. Um, and we, we try to live the Benedictine life in all its simplicity and authenticity. But we have also a special dedication to our Lady Queen of Apostles. And this reflects our charism to pray and sacrifice, especially for priests. If you think of Our Lady after the Ascension, as being a prayerful presence within the church, first at Pentecost, but then even in her hidden life after Pentecost, Our Lady was always there at the heart of the church. And she prayed especially for the apostles and at her little house in Ephesus that St. John built for her, she would often have the apostles come visit her and find a place of spiritual retreat and refreshment. So she's our inspiration in this and we try to model our life on hers by praying and sacrificing, especially for priests, and then having a place of retreat for them. If, say, a priest wants to make his annual retreat or just take a few days of recollection, they are welcome to come to our monastery. Um, as I said, our, our community is very young. It's only 25 years old, but it's been growing very rapidly. So three and a half years ago, our mother house in Gower, Missouri, was too full. We we're starting to make temporary cells in our basement with CD boxes and things like that, just to make a little extra space to squeeze in the young women who wish to try our life. Um, so three and a half years ago, our superior mother, Ava Cecilia, decided to send a group of sisters on foundation. Um, so there were seven of us who were sent from Gower in April of 2019. We came to the Diocese of Springfield to a little town called Ava. Uh, and this is our first, our first foundation, our first daughter house. Uh, we've already grown to, um, well, right now we're 10 sisters, but by Christmas we'll be 12. So um, the temporary house we're living in is starting to be a little bit tight. <laughs> and the mother house is full again. Thanks be to God, this is the vocation crisis we want. But we don't have room at the mother house or at the foundation for many more vocations. So this summer we broke ground on our permanent monastery in Ava. It's a beautiful tract of land. Um, of course, it's not the easiest time to be building with the inflation and extra construction costs. So we're praying very hard to St. Joseph that he'll see this work to completion. Okay. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, you mentioned the, I guess that, you know, people talk about all the statistics of there being a vocation crisis. Um, but it doesn't seem like that crisis necessarily pertains to traditional orders. Uh, and it, it sounds like you're seeing growth within, within your order. Is, is that correct? Like, like a good amount of growth? Yes. Thanks be to God. I mean, when we left the Abbey, almost four years ago, um, we were up to 44. Um, the Abbey was only built for 48, um, but now the Abbey's full again already, just four years later, they, they sent off us and then the, all of our face, places got filled up. And, and then this new house that we've started, it's already um, almost twice as big as it was at the beginning. So it's a good problem to have, we're grateful. And I think yes. it shows that young, <laughs> that young people today, um, they're looking for something authentic. They're looking for yes. um, truth and beauty and goodness, especially in the liturgy, which many traditional orders foster very carefully. Um, they're looking for the traditions that religious uh, life has had since, you know, St. Benedict's time. Um, things like the habit, the common prayer, the silence. Um, and so I think that's, that's why many traditional orders, even young ones like ours, are seeing such a rapid growth. The young people have an ideal and they see the traditions of the church as fulfilling that. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I like how you said people are looking for, for truth, unadulterated, well, you didn't say unadulterated, but unfiltered truth. Um, they're looking for beauty and reverence and society in the world today seems to be lying to people saying these things aren't important in your life. But I think inside us as people, we reach a point where we're tired of being lied to by society and we seek those things that are better than us um, or, or, or seek those things that are higher than us, like, you know, God, beauty, tradition, stuff like that. Um, and I, and I think that really speaks to orders, uh, like the one you're in and other traditional orders, because they offer the, the beauty and tradition that has historically been within the church. Um, I, I, I do have a question for you as well. Um, as far as um, what's the difference between a religious sister and a nun? Because I know a oh, lot of us have question. those questions. <laughs> yes. It, sometimes it's not very clear. Um, so the, the religious sister has uh, a more active, perhaps more visible role within the church. Uh, if you think of the church as having different members, as the human body has different members, I like to think of the active sisters as being like the hands um, or some, some exterior member that does Christ's work in an apostolate. Um, but the nuns uh, try to serve the body of Christ in a more interior fashion. And this is why nuns usually have some sort of enclosure in place. They're cloistered. Um, and so the, it just as the human body needs certain organs that are hidden from sight, like the heart or the lungs, but nevertheless fulfill a necessary function for the body. So the mystical body of Christ needs to have um, certain members set aside just to adore the Lord uh, just to sustain the prayer of the church and not to have an exterior apostolate. Um, I think Our Lady fulfilled this role in her uh, being the praying presence in the midst of the church at Pentecost and that thereafter. And this is what other cloistered nuns are called to do, to uh, be like the heart pumping the blood to the rest of the body or like the lungs drawing in the air for the rest of the body. The mystical body needs both. It needs the active sisters and it needs the contemplative nuns. Um, it's just two two aspects of love, two ways to serve Christ in his mystical body. So um, as far as discerning, like a, a young lady out there that is trying to discern, um, you know, religious life, whether they want to be a, a religious sister, whether they want to be a nun, um, what are some uh, I guess first let's start with the parents because I, I have two young daughters myself, 14 and 12. And 
I know I don't want them just to completely write off religious life. I know they they both, you know, <laughs> like being like a lot of young women. They like babies. They like being around babies and stuff like that. So right. it seems like the uh, like young girls, one of their first uh, things that they want to or the first way they gravitate towards as far as vocation seems to be marriage and a, and a lot of young women. But I want, uh, you know, my co-host Mark, his grandmother had a saying, give uh, give God first choice. So I've talked to them about, okay, well, once you're done with high school, don't, you don't have to rush off to college. You ain't got to rush off and get married and this or that, you know, maybe discern at least a year, give, give God first choice, discern just a year. And then after that year decide, you know, maybe which direction you want to go. If you need more time, of course you can take more time, but as parents, what can we do to cultivate our kids seriously looking at religious life? That's a beautiful question because I agree the vocation that a, a child experiences usually can be fostered by the parents. Um, I think the first thing is prayer. Um, there are many stories about parents who prayed for their children's vocations and it is a grace that can be prayed for. I think of St. Monica praying for St. Augustine. Uh, not only did she obtain his conversion, but she obtained his vocation. Yeah. Um, but then the, the other reason why parents should pray is just for their own sanctification their own witness for their children I know as a child I can remember seeing my parents pray um, say I would get up in the morning and see my mother uh, praying the divine office or my father when he came back from work at the end of a busy day would take what he called his quiet time with his spiritual reading and his private prayers and just seeing my parents make that time um, made me realize when I was young, I need this time also. I need quiet time with our Lord. Um, and this is a habit that children can start very early. And whatever their vocation in life, they need to have a personal relationship with our Lord, which can only be real if it's fostered by this personal, intimate conversation. Um, and so the parents, by fostering that in their own life, can encourage the children. Uh, and then the other thing I've, I'm very grateful for my parents for doing um, was leading us in our liturgical life also. So my mother would, um, we would go to mass on Sunday, of course, but my mother would try to take time during the week to get us to a weekday mass. And I found that was very important. It's not something that other uh, say children of Protestant family would, would know what that meant. You know, why go to church on a Tuesday? <laughs> But it's, right. it's important to realize, yeah, the Mass is for every day. It's the most, uh, it's the highest act of the mystical body. And so any time that a family is able to go more frequently, it, it emphasizes the importance, the primacy of the Mass. Okay. Uh, yeah, and beautiful. I think, too, your, your point. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I was just going to say that, that that's beautiful. You're, you're, you're right. But uh, go ahead and uh, finish your thought there. Oh, I, I think your idea about suggesting to the, your daughters to take the time to discern is important too, because uh, the marriage, the vocation to marriage is a very beautiful call, but as you said, it's, it's a kind of natural call too. There's already um, a desire in the human heart for a spouse and children, just naturally, even before considering the sacrament. But the call to religious life, there isn't a natural inclination toward that. Um, it's, it's a higher call in, in being completely supernatural. And so it's, it's good for children mm -hmm. to think um, of giving God that first opportunity. If they don't um, see it as a special invitation from him, then they might just go with the natural inclination first and, and not have the time to listen to him. No, that's that's good advice. Like I, I like the way you, you, you worded that with the natural inclination inclination i think that's uh, a very good way to to put that much better than the way i said it um, um so is uh, let's speak to the young girls now as far as discerning because what what advice or what would you what words of wisdom would you give to young girls as far as discerning because i know one question i'm asked and it's a common question as well is well how will i know which way god wants me to go because you're because you know it's it's not going to be a one-on-one -on -one conversation where 
you're given where God says, this is what you need to do, right? So, so the question is, how do I discern God's voice and which way he wants me to go? What, what kind of advice would you give to these young ladies? Yes, and that's, that's a very important point. You don't get a letter from God saying, this is what you need to do with your life. Right. <laughs> we have to cultivate the life of prayer. Um, the Holy Ghost speaks very softly. And so we need that time of silence and prayer to put him first. Um, and it doesn't mean that all of our prayer time is necessarily spent thinking about our vocation. We should just think about God. Um, think about his revelation, his goodness toward us in our personal life, um, and how we want to make that response to him. Uh, it's very good to pray, um, I love you, my God. I want to give you my life. How do you want me to give it to you? Kind of put the, um, the question in terms of a gift and also in terms of what he wants. Um, so again, prayer is, is essential in this sort of uh, discernment. I would also encourage uh, seeing vocations lived. Um, so for this, it might be good to talk to a priest or a religious that your family knows who could recommend good communities for children to visit. Um, I know when I was young, I always thought, oh, maybe I'll be a nun. I read certain books. I loved the lives of the saints. And they were, a lot of them were nuns. Uh, but I never saw them growing up. There weren't many communities where I lived. Um, and if I did happen to see a sister, it wasn't always the sort of order that I wanted. You know, say the sister was in lay clothes or something like that. I, I knew I wanted something authentic with the habit and all that comes with it. Um, Sometimes difficult, though, to find good orders. So that's why I recommend going to a priest or a, a religious that you trust who could say, well, this community is according to the heart and mind of the church. This community is stable and is growing, which are signs of health. Um, and then once you, you know some communities like that, then maybe the young women could visit. Um, they could start a correspondence with a sister. Um, because if you don't see the life lived, if you know, don't know anyone actually giving themselves to God in this way, it's hard to think of it concretely. It's not enough just to look on the internet. Um, maybe that's a good starting point, but at some point we have to, to go out and, and visit and meet the religious, try the life on. Um, and again, with that, that idea of offering ourselves to God, is this where you want me? And if he doesn't want you there, usually he has clear indications um, there might be a restlessness in the heart. Uh, there might be a deep desire um, to serve God in a different way. Um, just examples. So a young woman might visit a teaching order, um, but maybe the life in the classroom is unsettling um, or she doesn't find herself uh, at peace when she's trying to teach. Maybe that's an indicator for her to visit a cloistered community, a contemplative community. By the same token, you might have someone visit a contemplative community and feel the, or the restlessness or the need to uh, work in a hospital with a sick or again to teach or something like that. Uh, the Lord usually, if we're, if we're communicating with him and praying, he usually puts deep desires inside of us that are signs of his will. We don't have to pick the, the life that's most repugnant to us. You know, usually that's a bad way to go. Um, <laughs> It's, it, it takes discernment to see which are the desires that are just natural ones or um, lesser than higher ones. And sometimes we have to sacrifice a lesser desire for the sake of a, of a higher one. Um, but it's, it's not a question of just going against what God has put in our hearts. Yeah. And, you know, it just it, it kind of goes back um, to what. To the parents in a lot of ways too because it, earlier when you were speaking to the parents you mentioned about the parents not necessarily telling their kids what to do but leading by example like so many things leading by example is the best teacher mm -hmm. and then and then you know the advice to the kids you know we, we have so much information out there today easily at hand with the internet and social media and so on and so forth but none of those are personal relationships i like how you mentioned the kids, the young kids, the young ladies need to have a, if they can, find a personal relationship 
with with a sister or with a nun or whatever you know wh- whatever they're discerning instead of just going on the internet and saying oh the, this this is how this this order lives or this is what they do because you're not getting the full picture um it, you know like you would in a personal relationship even if it's i would say even if it's a pen pal type relationship at least you're you know you're interacting with with religious uh with the religious life yes in a way um so i i did before this episode a couple weeks ago i had my daughters actually write down some questions um that they might want to ask okay. and, and what and one of them I think fits in pretty well right here with what we're talking about. And one of them asked, uh, when did you realize that you were called to religious life? Oh, so yes, my, my discernment started young. Um, again, I, I enjoyed reading the lives of the saints and I, I read about many of them becoming nuns and I thought, well, maybe God wants me to be all his. Um, but that, so I guess this, the Paul started to be felt when I was about eight. Um, the challenge there was that at the age of eight, I didn't know religious. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't see them in my daily life, and so it was kind of a a dream um, that I I kept in my childhood and early teens. But it was only when I was older, when I actually went to college at Thomas Aquinas College in California, that I met other young people who were discerning. And they also knew good religious communities to visit. Um, so I think it became much more real then. Um, I finished my studies um, and I actually studied theology a little bit longer uh, at another school. And I, I think a special grace there was, I, I remember trying to write a long paper um, and I looked up from my computer one day and said, here I am, I'm thinking about God all day, I'm talking about God all day, I'm writing about God all day, and it's still not enough. <laughs> and I want to be thinking to God, I want to be talking with God. Uh, and that, I think, was a, a confirmation of the earlier dream I had had to be a contemplative nun. Um, and that was a strong impetus for me to put other things on pause, um, to try to visit those orders and, and see if there was one where I felt like God wanted me to be. So in follow-up to that question, I know one of the questions that they wrote down as well was what made you to de- what made you decide that you wanted to be a Benedictine nun versus a religious sister or do- a Dominican sister or, you know, all the other orders out there. What, right. what made you yeah. choose Benedictines? <laughs> yes. I don't think I had it in my heart to look for a Benedictine community initially. I was more looking for a, a community that was after the mind and heart of the church. Uh, one that had, again, the traditions of religious life, the traditional habit, um, a beautiful liturgy. And so I went to a priest friend of mine and asked him, what are some good orders where I could find these things? And he said, well, the Benedictine of Mary has much of that. Um, and so that was where I ended up visiting first. And it, it actually fit very well. I did make a few other shorter visits to other communities, but um, I found much of what I wanted right here in, in this community. I think the, the turning point was the prayer. We chant the divine office in Latin um, using very old books. So the, uh, the way Benedictine monks and nuns have prayed the divine office for years is we follow the order of the Psalms written in the Holy Rule by St. Benedict. So they've been prayed this way since the 500s. Um, and that way of prayer uh, answered a very deep desire in my heart. Uh, and so I would encourage any young woman, um, when you visit a community, see how they pray and see if this is a natural, a supernatural um, way for you also. Um, you can't just join a community because you like the, the exterior work it does, but the prayer doesn't nourish you. So I, I think that the liturgy was a very pivotal point for me. Um, and then the idea of being um, a nun, especially devoted to Our Lady, um, especially in her role for prayer for priests, um, that also satisfied a, a deep desire in my heart. That's great. Um... 
so what was your formation or, or what is the formation like for Benedictine nun? If you want to become a Benedictine nun, what, what was your formation process? Yes, uh, it's a long process. We have different stages to um, initiate the young woman gradually into the life. So when a woman decides, yes, I want to try Benedictine the very life, first she just comes on a come and see visit as an aspirant. Usually a week long, she lives with the sisters, does their work and prays with them. If that's um, if that goes well, if she feels like this is where God wants her to try, then she applies for entrance. And if she's accepted, then she begins with a candidacy of a month or two, sometimes longer. Uh, candidacy doesn't look different from aspirancy. They still wear lay clothes. Um, they still are called by their baptismal name. But they have made the commitment of leaving home. They're not going to go back after this. Um, but this time when they still have their lay identity, as it were, is helpful for the community to get to know them. And it's also so helpful for them to continue discerning before they put on, say, a new persona, <laughs> with a, a, a new name, a new habit. So yes, candidacy lasts a couple of months usually, and then they re become postulants. Uh, for our community, that just means a simple black dress with a, a short black veil. Um, you might think of how Julie Andrews dressed in The Sound of Music. It looks a little bit like that, <laughs> but it's still, um, it's not a habit yet. Uh, they're still called by their baptismal name, but now with sister in front of it. And the postulancy um, is just a, a more committed point uh, within the first stage of discernment. And if, if that goes well, then maybe after nine months or a year, they can be received as a novice. And at this point, as a novice, they receive the Benedictine habit. Um, so the, what I have right now, but with a white veil. Um, and they receive a religious name. Um, and this this stage is very dramatic. Um, we have the custom of the Pashans putting on a bridal gown and uh, going into the ceremony as, as a bride. And then uh, when they go to the sanctuary and petition to receive the habit, the bishop cuts off their hair as a sign of their sacrifice. And then the Pashan leaves and she puts on this the black tunic, and she comes and receives the rest of the habit from the hands of the bishop. Um, and so the transformation there is very dramatic. You go from seeing a bride in her gown, the long hair, uh, and when she when she finishes, she's a bride again, but in a religious sense. She has a habit, which is like the bridal gown we never take off, and she has a white veil to show that she's in probation still. And uh, the novitiate lasts for two years always, not longer, not shorter. Um, and it's the time of real training. Um, there are many classes that are taken um, for uh, monastic spirituality and history, liturgy, chant, Latin. Uh, and all this is, is seeking to form the sister interiorly so that she can um, respond generously to the grace of her vocation. And so after these two years of novitiate, um, she petitions to make vows. Uh, and if the community accepts her, then she professes uh, temporary vows, so just for three years. And the Benedictine formula is stability, conversion of life, and obedience, which it includes uh, the other counsels of poverty and chastity, uh, but it vows a little bit more because we, we vow our life to a certain religious family. That's the stability aspect. Um, and then the conversion of life, which includes poverty and chastity, it also has a sense of always striving for perfection. Um, so at the, at the profession of vows, the, so the sister receives a black veil, it's a sign of um, the vows. And she lives then mm, the, the life more fully. She no longer has classes. Sometimes she receives responsibilities within the community, um, but she's still in probation because Holy Mother Church wants to check in three years and make sure everything's going well before receiving those vows solemnly and forever. So after three years of temporary vows, then the, the sister can make her vows forever. Um, and at that point, she receives a black veil that's even longer than the um, professed, the simply professed veil. She also receives the wedding ring 
to show that she's a spouse to Christ. Oh. Um, and at that point, her her life belongs to Christ forever. It's not just a till death do us part, but it's a till it's a <laughs> unto eternity. Yes. So, uh, how long is the process in total? H- how many years? Uh, you, how, how many years is it? Yeah, usually six years. Sometimes okay. it can be extended. So, um, the simple vows can be extended as many as six years. So, the whole process could take 12. But usually, by the end of six years, a sister is very sure whether or not she wants to do the life forever. Right. Well, I had no it idea. I've never seen it. Yeah. No, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I've never seen um, a simply professed sister uh, extend her vows longer than the three years. It just is usually very clear at that point. Yeah, I, I had no idea that yeah. uh, you also received a, a, a wedding ring as well when when you made your final vows. I mean, I knew about the wedding dress uh, ceremony and the dress and all that. But I know that for most young women out there, girls growing up, they always envision having a wedding and having a wedding dress. It's just, a, you know, it seems to be a big deal for for girls and young ladies. And you still you still get that in religious life in, in a lot of ways because I, I pulled up some pictures here of some of some of the young ladies that are, you know, de- going through the process, and you can see they're they're wearing tr- uh, wedding dresses. They look, you know, yeah. it looks very nice, very, um, you know, reverent. And then you you see like you were talking about earlier with with the ceremony. Um, I didn't know if they had a picture of their hair being cut here. But uh, no, it's a, it looks like a very beautiful ceremony. I've never, never seen one um, or anything like that, but it, it sounds and looks very beautiful. Um, going to your baptismal name, is that something that you choose or is it chosen for you? Well, I'm not, not unlike um, the name that our parents give us, the superior also gives the, the name to the sister. Um, in our community, the custom is to make three suggestions. Um, so we generally write, Mother Abbess, I I would like these names for these reasons and make the three suggestions. But Mother Abbess is free to pick something entirely different, um, make a different combination, or to give the, the sister her baptismal name a second time. We have one sister um, who received her baptismal name. Um, and it's kind of a dramatic moment in the ceremony because the sister doesn't know going in what the name is that she will receive. The first time she hears it is when the bishop pronounces it. From now on, you will be called sister so-and-so. Um, and so it's, it's very dramatic to hear um, the name be given as the one that Christ has envisioned for you to have. And even if it's not the one that you asked for, there's a, a special mystery associated with that name, a special patronage with the, the saint uh, that it belonged to. Um, and it's a very rich source of grace for the novice beginning her novitiate to have this this new name that represents her new purpose, her new vocation. So you, your your name is Sister Mary Yosef. Hopefully, I'm saying saying it right. Um, <laughs> what's that? Sister Mary Josepha. Josepha. Okay. All right. As usual, I, I'm not very good at pronouncing words, <laughs> but uh, uh, Sister Mary Josepha, is that a name that, that you listed or was it a total surprise? I did ask for St. Joseph. I asked for Josepha in honor of St. Joseph. But after I submitted the names, I kept thinking, oh, I should have asked for something with Our Lady too. Uh, I had had Our Lady in my baptismal name uh, as my second name. And so I had always been grateful for that and I, I thought why didn't I put something for Our Lady on those suggestions and so when Mother Abbas added that of her own initiative and I heard it from the bishop's mouth you we will be called Sister Mary Josepha I I was very grateful for our Lord and he named me after his his parents on earth you know his <laughs> his blessed mother and his father and I couldn't ask for anything more than that <laughs> <laughs> um 
let's talk about your your daily life. What what is what is your daily schedule uh, like each day? Um, and and what are some yes. some of the activities that you that you partake in? Yes, our day starts fairly early. We get up before the sunrise, and we chant the psalms just as Saint Benedict described it in his Holy Rule, written in the five hundreds. Uh, so we pray the office of matins, um, usually about 45 minutes to an hour. And then we have about another 45 minutes to an hour of private prayer. Um, and then we go back to the chapel for lauds and prime. So we, in the first two or three hours of the day, we're either praying with the Psalms in the, in the way of the church, uh, the public prayer of the church, or we're praying in our hearts um, and nourishing that with spiritual reading. Uh, and that's how every day begins. We, it's called, um, it's during the period that we call grand silence. So there's no speaking at all for the first two or three hours of the day. And we try to devote ourselves entirely to prayer. Uh, both again, the, the sung prayer and then the private prayer. Uh, after prime, our work day begins. So we're allowed to speak as necessary to say, get our work done, <laughs> questions in the kitchen, uh, questions in the sewing room, those can all be asked, but in a low voice and with certain restraint so that we can keep the silence as much as possible and continue the contemplation in our hearts, the interior conversation in our hearts. And we punctuate our work with little, um, little offices, little times of chanting the songs in the chapel. Um, and of course, the high point of the day is Holy Mass. Um, that it, it kind of crowns the divine office. Uh, the little hours leading up and coming from it are the preparation and then the overflow from the graces of Holy Mass. Um, we do have an hour of recreation every day when we speak more um, in a more relaxed manner. We share the time as a family with our other sisters. Sometimes we have work that we do while we talk. Uh, sometimes we'll take a walk, uh, but the, the important thing about recreation is the talking to sh have, again, the community sharing, um, the family support from our sisters. Um, we also have another period in the afternoon or evening for more prayer and spiritual reading. Um, so the day, it, it is spent mostly in silence. Um, we have little times of sung prayer in the chapel, and then we have that time of community gathering. Um, and then at the end of the day, we go back into the grand silence when we speak only in our hearts with our spouse. I guess I should say something too about our work. I didn't mention specifically what we do. So as cloistered nuns, we don't have an apostolate. Uh, say we don't go out and serve the sick or the poor, or we don't teach. Um, but we do the household work that's necessary um, the cake cooking, cleaning. Um, as Benedictines, we try to support ourselves as much as possible by the work of our hands. So we try to have a big garden. Um, and when possible, we have animals. At our mother house, we have dairy cows and chickens. Uh, well, we're still small on foundation. We don't have uh, animals yet. So we just have the garden. But we hope in our new monastery to have uh, dairy cows and chickens, just like the abbey. And then uh, we support ourselves by making vestments. And, and this is a special work because we can put our spiritual apostle of praying for priests into it. As we work on each vestment, we pray for the priest who will wear it. We'll pray, we pray for the priests to whom that priest will minister, uh, or the souls to whom that priest will minister. Um, and the, again, the beauty of that work is it can be done in the cloister and in silence. So it's, it's very natural for us. Yeah, we. I actually was. Act, I was actually talking last night to a group of friends, and we were talking about silence and how difficult silence is in the modern world, especially because you have constant noise uh, coming in. And I read a book, "The Power of Silence" by Cardinal Sarah uh, a while back, and I remember he was talking about the power of silence, <laughs> and. Uh, he mentions how hard it can be to do because a lot of us have internal dialogues like myself, you know, I may sit in silence and I'm say, okay, well, I'm just going to sit down, be quiet. 
and I'm going to, like, if I'm in adoration, I'm going to try to hear the voice of God. But then all of a sudden you're mm-hmm. having this internal dialogue with yourself about something that is completely unrelated to what you're supposed to be doing right now, which is having that conversation with God in adoration. Yes. Right. And he mentions, he mentions that basically until you can shut all that off and just even be quiet mentally, then you will hear, you will better hear God's voice. And I think that also speaks to discerning uh, vocation life in order to hear um, the voice of God, you need to cultivate the ability to sit in silence and listen. And um, I'm just glad the church has uh, men and women dedicated to this silence on praying for the priest and praying for the church because, because we need it because lay people like myself are not very good at, at cultivating that silence. Um, With that said, would you have any advice to just lay people in general, like how to cultivate that silence? Yes, and I will say that we contemplatives, even in the silence of our cloisters, still have the same struggles with that interior dialogue. It's like um, one of your fathers said, um, it's it's as if each person has a water mill running inside. Um, (laughs) The mind is always moving. It's always going to be going. But the question is, what do we put to nourish, to keep that wheel spinning, right? We can have it full of the daily duties. We can have full of our own thoughts and desires, our own complaining, I'm sorry to say, all these things can be moving that into your water wheel inside. But what, what we try to do is um, to replace the natural thoughts with God's thoughts. Um, so the times for reading, the times for praying the Psalms give us ideas and thoughts that we can think of to lift ourselves out of our own petty ideas and desires. Um, so for, for laity, a similar thought uh, would be to take time every day for a little spiritual reading. It could be a little bit of the scriptures. Uh, sometimes it's helpful to read a spiritual book to help understand the scriptures or to address a particular need. But of course, going to the living word of God in scripture is the most fruitful sort of spiritual reading. And other books can supplement that and strengthen it. But having something to put in to the mind and heart um, can quiet down some of the other thoughts. And then when uh, some train of thought gets going, um, you have a a little store of other things to think about. Um, So that's one thought, to have um, a source of, of spiritual nourishment, spiritual ideas. Um, and then the other thing that might be helpful would be um, to have a couple of points in the day to quiet oneself down, even if it's, if it's only for a moment or two, to refocus on our Lord in the course of the day. So in Catholic homes, it's very helpful to have holy pictures around. Um, sometimes in the course of the day, you might be too busy. You might not have have time to sit down and read of a, a many chapters of a book, but you can always look up and see that picture of the Sacred Heart or of the Blessed Mother and make an interior uh, aspiration. The, the Desert Fathers would call it that ejaculation of the heart um, to, to just say, I love thee, I, I offer my life to thee, um, and to lift up the heart to God in the course of the day. I think both of these are necessary, both that, that quiet time of reading and personal prayer, but then the the little glances to heaven that punctuate the rest of the day. And it, it that can dispose the heart to make better use of the, the time for quiet prayer. Then when you come to it, you've already been thinking about God at different points of the day. You've been looking forward to this meeting with him. And then it's easier to, to focus on him and be less distracted. Yeah, I think what you just mentioned really also speaks to what when St. Paul mentions pray without ceasing, you know, it's, I think a lot of times people confuse that with, I've got to sit down and do long drawn out prayers all day long. But I think it's the mindset, like you were saying, look at holy images um, or, you know, just, just say a quick prayer, uh, you know, in the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy spirit, just to, 
when Paul, when St. Paul says pray without ceasing, just be in that prayerful mindset all day where you're uh, given, given praise or given thought to God at, you know, throughout the day. I, I think those are very valuable tips. Um, like you said, in, in order and to cultivate could that prayerful life. Yeah, if I could add one more thought, um, there's a lot of background noise in the modern world. Whenever you go into a store, the, there's a radio going. It's often in the car, there's a radio going. It's, it's a danger, I think, in the modern household to have a media outlet going all the time. You know, a TV playing, um, the computer always on, the radio always on. So if, if it helps to shut those off, um, to work in silence sometimes, or to play spiritual music, um, these things can calm the spirit down. Uh, can they can lift the mind to God, and best of all, they can get things stuck in the mind. <laughs> you know how we can get a, st a song stuck in our heads. Um, oh yeah. Sometimes it's hard, even in the voice, a secular song will get stuck in our heads again. <laughs> um, but we have sung prayer uh, in the divine office. We have sung prayer during the mass, and after a while the Gregorian chant gets stuck in our heads or the hymns get stuck in our heads. And that is a very easy way to have the mind lifted toward God. We don't have to be forcing our imaginations, but we just listen to the beautiful sound and just playing in our heads, of course. And um, it can quiet the heart down to listen to God. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. The, the media TVs, computers, um, radios constantly playing in the house. I know when, in our house, we, we limit how much, uh, our kids and stuff and even ourselves or we'll listen to those things. Now we, we do better some days than others, <laughs> obviously like most people, but I I've noticed before, like it, it's crazy. Like if you, if you sit in your room and even, even, even a fan going is some noise and you cut off that fan TV, all the noise around you, it's almost, you got like this, uh, this feeling in your ear that feels good. It's just silence. It's like your ears needed that rest. You know, <laughs> it's almost like, it's almost like yeah. God has made us for points of, of our life to just sit in silence and contemplate him. Um, like we, we have yes. that need as people. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no constant noise is, is, um, is definitely an issue. Um, Another another question that one of my daughters had that I think is really good and and I'll ask you is she asked um do you always feel really close to God? That is a very good question and I think it can admit of a, a few different answers. Um <laughs> what does it mean to feel close to God? <laughs> um there are often consolations that come. Um say we're, we're out on a walk on a beautiful day nature really proclaims the glory of God. Um, and so you can, you can see the providence of the creator in making this beautiful day just for you to enjoy. <laughs> um, it could also come through uh, the friendship of the sisters in your community or within your family when you feel someone's love in a very strong way. It's just a sign of God's love for you. He put that person in your life. Um, he put that love for the, that person has for you in that person's heart. Um, and so, again, a, a way to experience God's love through another. Um, but there are also times when in, in prayer, in reading the scriptures, at Holy Mass, when we can feel that love of God more directly. Um, and it, those are precious times to realize in the scriptures, this is God speaking to me. Or to realize after Holy Communion, God is in my heart. I'm united to him, body and soul. Um, precious times to realize the love of God for us. But I will also say that we do go through dry times, as it were, or distracted times, uh, times of in interior struggle, when God does feel far away. Um, but we know that we are always united to him, even when we don't have a, a sensible consolation, if you know what I mean. In our Lord's own life, on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was a moment of intense suffering. But he also had said earlier, right before the Passion, I am never alone. 
but the Father is always with me. So in a mysterious way, even in the midst of that great suffering, his human soul still experienced the beatific vision. And of course, he was always united in the divine person to the, the blessed Trinity. There was never any division there. But he still experienced an interior desolation. Um, and I think that's encouraging for us as we go through the ups and downs of life. When we encounter trials or interior crosses, we know that God is always present and perhaps even more present. Maybe he's most close in those moments when we feel the, the loneliness, the dryness most acutely. I remember Mother Teresa saying to one of her sisters, um, her sister was experiencing a great trial, um, suffering very acutely. And Mother Teresa said to her, this is the moment when Jesus is kissing you. He's this close to you. He's sharing his cross with you. Um, and I, I think that it's important for us to realize whether in the cloister or in the lay life, um, the times of suffering are often the times when we are closest to God, when his cross is on our shoulder too. Um, and not to be discouraged. He'll never let us be tried beyond our strength. And so um, <clears throat> I know we're coming up on an hour here and I'm, of course, want to respect your time and everything. I know you've got a, a daily routine. So just a uh, couple questions. I think they're more personal, more fun questions that my daughter's had as well, because if, if I'm correct in my saying here, the Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles, y'all put out music CDs, right? Or, or albums and everything, yes. right? Are you, are you involved in this, in, in singing in these, in these choirs? Most of us have been. Um, there was a period, say our first uh, six CDs, when most of the community sang. I, I sang for all those recordings. The last three or four, maybe, uh, because our community's gotten so large, and also because we are now in two houses, it's no longer feasible. It's hard to get a, a group of 50 nuns to record a CD, <laughs> uh, especially when they're in two different parts of Missouri. So the last... Um, maybe four CDs have been recorded by a smaller group. Um, but it's it's still something that we cherish as a community. We we love to sing together. It's a sign of our unity, a sign for our love for God. No, and the and and the music is absolutely beautiful. I've talked to a few friends of, of mine, uh, and when we mentioned that we were gonna be having a discussion with you, they they always bring this up and everybody is always just in awe of the beauty of your music. Um so we we thank you people we lay people in the world, thank you for bringing that beauty out to us so that we can enjoy it with, with our families and you know, even within ourselves. Um I guess the last question I'll ask you is, and, and again, this one was from my younger daughter. She says, what is your favorite thing to do? <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> um, I, this might not be a satisfying answer from her perspective, but I like doing the things I'm supposed to do when I'm doing it. <laughs> so when I'm in the office, I'm very happy to be praying that office. It could go on as long as God wants it to go on. Um, when I'm when I'm doing the work, when I'm recreating with the sisters, I, I find my joy in knowing that this is what God wants me to do right now. And I think this is a particular gift of the religious vocation. We don't have to do much um, discerning in the course of a day. You know, in the lay state, um, a lay person would have to think, well, maybe I'll do this spiritual reading right now. Maybe I'll go spend this time with my family right now. Maybe I need to do extra work right now. But for the religious, everything is covered by obedience. And we know that the sound of the bell calling us to our, our different activities is the sound of God's voice saying, I'm not interested in what you were doing anymore. I want you to do this now. <laughs> and so there's a, a great security in that, a great source of peace and consequently of joy. No, I think that's a very good answer because... Um people tend to struggle with contentment and finding happiness in what they're doing. We're always looking for the next thing. So I think, you know, my daughter may have had a different idea in that question, like you mentioned, but I think, I think the answer you gave her far exceeded anything that she thought she would 
hear or anything that she thinks she needed to hear because because you're right find contentment in the things you're doing at that time slow down your life and just just enjoy uh enjoy your life and honor god in all things that you do i think it's i think that was the perfect answer <laughs> um yeah. so uh, as we close here, I'll just to let our listeners know. I'll include some links into the um, in the in the show note descriptions um, how to how to uh, get to your website because um, people can go there, learn more about you, learn how to support your work um, either through prayer or through financial uh, donations. Because I, I believe you guys are you mentioned are building a new monastery and, and are yes. always in need of, of, of funds because of your, your growth that you're having. So if anybody has it in their heart to donate, please consider giving to the Benedictines of Mary queen of apostles. Um, with that said, I will give you final thoughts. If you have anything that you want to mention. Uh, I thank you very much for your time today. I thank you also for mentioning the building project. We do need a lot of prayers and, material support for that um thank you for sharing this this interview with the, the people i i want them to know that we are praying for them uh, our cloistered life is very hidden but we we take it seriously to bring your intentions to the divine office to um see ourselves as as bringing your needs to our lord throughout the day um and so know that you're a part of that we have special prayers for our benefactors throughout the day. And on our website, you'll see um, the opportunity to make prayer requests. We, we take those prayer requests very seriously. We, we read them as a community. And as part of the um, preparation for the divine office is to empty the heart and fill it up with the intentions that we've been given. So please know that we are praying for you and please keep us in your prayers. We none need them too, you know, to be faithful, to be generous uh, in answering God's call. We're all part of one mystical body and all the members need to be supporting each other. Amen. And again, thank you for coming on and uh, thank you everybody for, for listening. And as my co-host Mark says, life is hard, but it's harder when you don't pray the rosary. God bless. God bless you.